you guys could grab a seat there and back. Is this good stuff, by the way? You guys good? Okay. Now, what I want to do is kind of take a vote here. Um, I was going to talk about um, master lease options. And since you guys are back here on time, we're going to take the vote now. Master lease options is where you do a master lease over an apartment building, and you sublease out to the tenants, and your hope is that your mortgage payment and expenses are going to be less than the rent that you have that you're taking in, and of course, all the rent raises and things like that belong to you. Now, I can either continue with stuff like this and go off of, you know, practice this a little bit more with you, or I could talk about the master lease option through, a, we could do a webinar and I could do that, or I can send you the PowerPoint for that. How many people, by show of hands, want me to continue with this stuff? Okay, how many people want me to do the master lease option? Okay, there's the answer. Okay. So, I will, before I jump into that though, what's that? You have weighted vote? I don't know about that. So, before I jump into that, I just kind of want to review again that. <laughs> I already did. I don't need, you know, we're all adults here. They know I start on time. Right? <laughs> I have something to say. I was wrong. Karen was right. The uh, rent comps that she was giving you were actually, actually accurate. Uh, okay, see, those, that's why I stopped. But he grabbed the mic and. I had to grab the mic from her to be wrong. So, yeah, I don't, you know, whether they come in, that's there. They know I start right on time. I've, I, you know, right? Well, not anymore. Can you hear them now? Very little. Anyway, I will say before I go to that other, to the master lease option side, um, I will say that um, this stuff, like I said before the break, takes practice. It really does. And I know for some of you, that might be something that um, I just need to select one thing here. Bear with me two seconds if you could. Do do do. Do do do. Do 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 do. I said bear with me. I didn't say get crazy now. Okay. Okay, I guess no one's talking to me, I'm talking to myself. Okay, so, before I get on to the master lease stuff, I just want to uh, uh, finish off with what I was talking about um, here. This stuff not only takes practice, but this is where you are going to start to find the creativity of with what you're doing. Now, I wanted to take this deal. Now, Raphael and Robert said, please work the total return on investment for me when we get back from break. And they're not here. Do you see what I, what I do here? So I'm going to work it anyway. Yeah, I'm going to work it anyway, OK? Like I said, we're all adults here. You guys know I start pretty much right on time. Uh, so let's say this, by the way, Penny is not here as well. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a good deal. I mean, I would look at this deal. I would take the next step with this deal, which would be to, from this point of view, based on what I know, I'd put in an offer. Because I know the asking price is nine twenty-five. dollars but gosh, I can figure a way that I'll at least get an 18.4% return and maybe even leverage that. I might go on at this one. Can you give me just two seconds to explain this, please? I might go on at this one and say right from the beginning, I'll give you your asking price, but I'm going to ask for that 80-10-10. I might do this right at the beginning. By the way, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Nothing. Nothing at all. Now, they may say, well, 
I don't want a 6% interest rate on my 10%. I'd want a 7 or an 8. In this side of the world, it's much better to put in the offer and then figure out if you want to buy it or not, meaning you're studying the investment. You're going to study the performance of that. So on something like this, I would take the next step, put in the offer, and move forward. Does that make sense? It's different than the residential side of the world where you kind of look at the place perhaps, well some of you don't because you're from Canada, but you look at the place, you might look at it again, then you put in an offer. On the, on the commercial side of the world, it's very normal to put in an offer even before you see the property. That's a very normal thing. From 30,000 feet out, knowing what I know now, in working these numbers, I would move forward on this. I put in an offer, I would probably go 80-10-10. I'm giving the seller his or her asking price, and I'm taking my terms. Now, if we get this under contract, we still have due diligence to go through. There's still negotiating here that could be done. Still negotiating that could be done. Remember, you've got credits at closing, you've got deferred maintenance, you've got uh, rent credits, which I'd like to explain real quick here because we didn't cover that this morning. And we've got some other ones that we could impose. Let me just talk about rent credits here for one moment. These rents, I think Penny said the average rent here was 575 okay so let's say that we take 575 and times it by 32 we get how much oh that's right Paul you're still working oh look Raphael and Robert are back I just want to let you know while you guys were gone I ran through the total return on investment exercise so you'll have to review the videos to get your, your, your answers okay so what is it, Paul? I don't know. What am I doing? 575 times 32. 18,400? 18,400. 18, okay. 18,400? <laughs> okay, great. Somewhere around 18,4. So, 18,4. Thank you, Wayne. Dallas, what was the number here then? 433,629. Okay, great. Great. You can see why Dallas has had most of the issues in the room. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's 18,400. Now, that is if all units, where did I write that, sorry. That's if all units are full and paying rent. Let's just make that assumption because I want you to get the overall theory. Now, most people would say that um, you should close near the beginning of the month. How many people have heard that? You've heard that? Okay. How many people have heard that you should close near the end of the month? Okay. So we've got disparity in the room, I see. Beginning, end. How many people heard that they should close right at the middle of the month? A few hands. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Um, and those are probably all right. You know, however, I want, those are probably right for somebody else, not for me. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this statement down. And this statement is this. Before I give you that statement, though, let me tell you why this is important. If you've got 18,400 and you divide that, Paul, by 30, you get what? Because there's 30 days in a month. $613 per day. That's per day of credit. So if you close on the first of the month and all the rents are collected, you should get $18,400 in credit. But how often are all rents paid by the first day of the month? Not many. Not many. Now, if you close on the last day of the month, you get $613 for the credit. Not a lot of credit there, right? You see, if you close in the middle of the month, you're going to get about 9200 if you close on the 15th, if all rents are collected. Notice I keep saying that. If all rents are collected, the challenge is they really aren't. That's a turbulent, dynamic thing. So if you close about the 5th or 6th, you're probably going to have a better chance of having more rents collected than on the 1st. Does that make sense? 
But if you have a credit for the balance of the month, say the final 25 days, and that credit goes on your closing statement, um, you probably still have rents that are going to come in after you close. You actually have to go back and split those up and give the seller whatever comes in. It's a mess. It's a mess. So I put this statement in my sales contracts. And it goes a little something like this. Buyer to receive a full month's rent credit regardless of the day of closing for all occupied units. Buyer to receive a full month's rent credit regardless of the day of closing for all occupied units. Now that's one sentence in your sales contract. Will the seller go for that? I don't know. I don't know the situation of the seller. Uh, I've done it. It's been accepted t sometimes. Other times it has not been accepted. <coughs> Buyer to receive full month's rent credit for all, or regardless of the day of closing for all occupied units. Let's just say in this example, they accept it. $18,400 is our credit. Just check out what this one sentence does. If we go back down to our performance sheet here, we'll see that our last cash return on investment is $22,877. Um, we have zero in because uh, Raphael used an equity line of credit. So I want to go back up to the previous cash return on investment where we show an actual return. So you didn't use that. Let's say you used cash. Okay. So we're going to go up to this cash return on investment right here. 26877 is our cash flow. And 92500 is our down payment. If I take this and just work with this a little bit and come down here. I know you can't see that and rework that now with this new scenario of this $18,400 credit, I'm going to rewrite that equation. So 26,877, Paul, you're working this right? Divided by 73,600. 73,600 gives us a return of? 36.5%. Do you see we just took, again, our percentage from 29% all the way to 36% just by adding that one sentence in our sales contract. So today, when we talked about adding things to your sales contract that will make you money immediately, this is one of them. Does everybody see that? Now, you might say, well, John, how many times would the seller, seller takes that more than you think. Also, I've also had it uh, uh, called on me. Hey, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to have to work another thing out. And you negotiate from there. But I wanted you to get the point. Plus, I estimated that everything was 100% occupied as well. That's not the norm either. So what does the 73 come from? The 73 comes from your down payment. You're going to take that credit of 18,400 bucks that you're getting as the rent credit for all occupied units for a full month and you're subtracting it from the 92.5 to give you the 73.6. Okay? All right. Dale. That's the first year return. I'm just doing a one year return. I'm not doing projected five year. You could do an average over five years. You could certainly do that. I'm just doing one year right now. Yeah, well, I did answer his question number one, Scott, but <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm just talking about one year. I'm not talking about five-year projections now. I've got to keep this simple. I know some of you know more than this. I, I know that, but I've got to stay considerate of the whole mass here and teaching them, so I can't get too complex here. This is just for one year, okay? You, You're welcome, Valerie, <laughs> okay? Yes, there is a, a five-year return and a 10-year return we can go to, but this is just for one year. Yes? Couldn't you do that with the hydro and other stuff as well? Possibly. If you're getting credits for that, sure. 
Absolutely. Those are called utility deposit credits, perhaps, and things like that. Yes, absolutely. Yep. We good? Anybody else? Okay. I had a Paul? slight correction. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't matter too much, but I, I use 9200 as the NOI, not 92.5, so it's off by a smidge. It's 36.3. I just want to mention it before I get called on it by any of the Paul, way to go. I appreciate that. Not a lot of people admit their mistakes. Very good. Does he do this at home? He's yeah, he's good. I think he's good. So it's only 36.3%. I just, the, the overall theory here is you, little things mean a lot to return. And if you only have $100,000 to work with, don't take all that $100,000 and put it on one property. Find out where you can add leverage and maybe you can take buy three properties for thirty-three thousand each and get a much higher return by adding that leverage. That's the that's the lesson here. Yes, Wayne. I know we're not doing more than one year, but all of the things that you're talking about have multi-year impact, right? Of course, yep. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Because what you're gonna do, thanks Scott for starting this. <laughs> what you're gonna do is um, you're gonna have a five-year projected return maybe even a 10-year projected return. Um, for those of you that are using Property Evaluator, anybody use that? Show of hands, okay, quite a few of you. You'll see you're, you're able to do that, like over a five-year projected return, and absolutely yes, you can, you can definitely take advantage of the stuff you're doing here over that return. Yeah, sure. My, my point was nothing, I guess I'd say it the other way, none of what I see you doing has only a single year impact. None, none, none. Paul, you have a question? Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> uh, all of this is based on an 80% bank financing. Uh, how, I know we did that just for the numbers, but how realistic is it for us to expect to get 80% bank financing? Should, should we, when we do these, use 75%? Yeah, I had that question. Again, I don't care where the deal ends up when I'm running par, I always run 80%. Now, that doesn't necessarily answer your question. Your question is, what's the real world today? I think you should expect somewhere between 70 and 80 percent uh, on a commercial deal. Okay, it's when you get, and you may run into issues under a million dollars. We were just talking about that uh, with somebody in the, the hallway there. Over a million dollars, it's a little bit easier to get the, the financing. I know it sounds like it shouldn't be, but that's how it is. Okay? We have 202 units. Right. Yeah. Dallas. Um, with what you're teaching us and everything that you're doing, this is obviously 15 years in the making, right? Now, when I talk to you, I've known you for a while now. I love you. <laughs> Too much information. <laughs> There's no hook. It's just that I, I, hopefully I can ask, or ask the question for some other people, but when I see you gets overwhelming at times. I mean, I, I can go home, sit, sit down, and really kind of break this down. But tell us, because you started where we started, actually, you know, with, with the, some of the things that we have accessible, but you didn't know all of this. You have to go through the whole process. So for us seeing what you're doing and doing this kind of, and in depth, the whole thing that you've done up to this point, like, bring us back to your beginning, because we're here in the beginning right now, right? Yeah. First and foremost, I got to go back to this. I practice this. I know it well because I practice it. You've heard that practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent kind of thing. I do, I practice it. How many of you, I've told you to memorize those formulas. I know my stuff. When I get in front of a room with bankers, investors, or if I had to, to talk to Cinnabon guy, I would know my stuff. I, would, I know how to talk, I know the formulas. Those formulas, because I work with them here. You see how many formulas I work with here, right? Cash return on investment, debt service coverage ratio, cap rate, all of those things. I'm able to work them because I know them. And this process of PAR, 80-20, 80% bank financing, 20% down payment, and understanding that I want a constant to go off of. Um, if I don't have a constant, by the way, to go off of, I don't know what is kind of normal. If, I, if I'm on a tee box on a hole, I don't know if it's a par 3 or a par 80. 
I want to know what that is because what's normal on a par four is it should take me four shots from tee box to cup. Tee box to cup, okay? And that's what I want to be cognizant of with these deals. I want to know what's in a normal world, how should this perform? Now, it may not end up in 80-20. I might not get 80% bank financing, I only might get 70. I might not have 20% to put down, I might get 70, 20, 10. 70% bank financing, 20% down, or uh, seller financing, 20% down payment. Or I might get something, another combination. I don't care where it ends up, but I gotta know what par is on that particular property first. That's why I run through this. I don't use, and I'm not saying not to, it's fine, but I don't want to use the green sheet first for me and my situation. I want to work these out first, and then I might pull out the green sheet, okay? I work these by hand, and I've worked them by hand for 15 years because it's quick. It doesn't really take very long. You see how fast it is when I'm getting information from you and having Paul work the numbers. When I'm at my desk and I'm looking at these, it's very quick. As a matter of fact, if you're working with your coach, uh, what I would expect of you with your deals is to run it at par. You run it at par and when you send it to that coach or send it to me, say, John, we found three deals and these three deals at par operate like this. One is 20% uh, return at par, the other one is a 12% return at par, and the other one's a 3% return at par. Here's what we're gonna do. Tell me really quickly about the 3%. And if nothing spectacular there, we're moving it out of the way, that fast. We don't have time to work on dead deals. The 12% one, we're gonna work and we're gonna do things like we did here. 18.4 to 29, 29 to 36. The one greater than 15, I'm gonna say tell me about it a little bit. What's happening there? Why is somebody willing to give such a great return at par without doing anything to the deal whatsoever? The sweet spot of 5 to 15 was designed to tell me, hey, this is acting very much like a quote unquote normal deal. I can still massage it and manipulate it to get a higher return, but at par it's normal. At greater than 15, you know, it's acting kind of strange. Is this too good to be true? Usually there's a story behind the numbers. And I learned to sense that when I look at this. So when I see a high cap rate, an elevated cap rate, I would say 11 or over, it typically is telling me that that income stream is not as stable as it should be. When I say income, I'm talking NOI. And when I say see a less stable income stream, that usually translates into a high cash return on investment and a debt service coverage ratio that's really high. Why would somebody move a deal to market like that with such a great return? Why wouldn't they give it a higher price point? It would be worth more in the market, right? Does that make sense? I also will take that NOI and if there's a scenario of cap rate scenario, uh, issue, meaning the deal doesn't seem to be priced right because of its return, I will take its NOI and apply what you think the market cap rate is, I think I did that in the first or second deal, to see what this should be priced at. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's how I work this. I've been doing that for 15 years. I'd recommend that this thing is practice, practice, practice. Find your location, find your team, work your numbers, work this PAR exercise, work it over and over and over again. 80-20, 80% bank financing, 20% down payment. It may not work out that way, but at least you've got something that gives it a, a, a normal world to operate in, see how it performs, and make your decision from there.